Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> oh, I, I will I will give you instructions about that. Don't don't yeah because you're not writing the paper at this time. I mean the paper is still due a few weeks from now. But uh, you know I, I wouldn't worry too much about about uh, a bibliography if you're using essentially the rule is if you're using sources on the syllabus. Well, I know those sources, right? So if you say Amartya Sen, it's good enough. I know what what reading you are citing. But if you are citing one of Amartya Sen's 50 other books, then I will need the citation. Because then I don't know which book you're referring to. I mean, he's got 50 books, right? So, you know, but if you're, if you're using one or two of the readings on, on the syllabus, you don't need to give me the full bibliographic details, you know. Yeah, okay? So I will write an essay um, as to a reader like you. You understand all the books and you fully understand what I'm talking about. So I don't need to write a lot of well, I don't know if I fully understand uh, what you're writing because it depends on the level of uh, articulation that you have. I mean, if you're writing something uh, which is grammatically incorrect, well, frankly, I may not be able to understand it, right? But, but uh, uh, yes, at a general level, you should assume that I know the book, okay, uh, and that I have a certain level of understanding, and, you know, you proceed on that level. But, uh, I mean, what you really need to be thinking about very simply is, you know, say you watch a film, okay? And very often when you watch a film, you enter into a discussion of the film with your friends, okay? And, you know, what would you do? You would basically take the film apart, right? You do a critique, right? You do an analytical critique of this book. Now, you, that doesn't mean you touch on everything. You're not going to be able to do that. But you pinpoint one or two points, one or two arguments, one or two theses, which interest you. Right? So it could be the issue of poverty, it could be the issue of organization, it could be his representation and understanding of small town India. You know, for those of you who started reading the book, well, you know, China, for example, right? I mean, I'm going to actually talk a little bit about that today. Uh, right? So it could be any number of things. But, you know, I suggest that uh, wait until the third, end of the third week before you start to think about it, because by then you would have done more readings in the course as well. And you might, you might get some ideas as to what you want to write on. Yeah. All right. Anything else that anybody would like to ask? Uh, uh, and again, you know, it could be up anything that we've covered up to this point in time. All right. So what I propose to do today is to today finish with my overview. Um, I mean, I've suggested different angles that we can pursue to uh, look at India in the post-1947 uh, period. Um, and uh, from next week onwards, uh, lectures are going to be more focused on specific issues. So, you know, the, for example, there's a whole set of issues related to India's economic growth and development. Uh, but the overview is important because you need to have politics, economics, culture, public spaces, all of these things in mind. And what I'm going to do today is uh, focus essentially on two things. One is a set of comparisons. Um, and again, each of these comparisons you, you could do a whole book on each of these, and, or several books, and obviously it has been done by people who are scholars who work on these areas. Uh, for example, the comparison of India to China. Uh, and I'm going to suggest certain limitations uh, in some of these comparisons, but I want to go through a series of them. And here I've said, and so on, because there are obviously others as well. So for example, you could say, well, uh, the India uh, of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, women, as opposed to the India of men. That, you know, when statistics are generated about things, they're very often generated keeping men as a template in mind, if I may put it this way. Okay? So when uh, in the 19th century studies were done of healthcare and medicine, um, the assumption was that you took the male as the norm and you did the studies. And obviously something like women's health is really only a field that develops, frankly, only in the last four decades or so. Okay? So you could go down the list, and we could come up with all other kinds of comparisons, but I'm giving you some big templates here that I think you need to keep in mind. And we'll go through each of them systematically to some degree. So that's the first set of things. And the second set of things is to return to a subject and now flesh it out. And that is the subject of democracy in India. And I'm going to give you, you know, close to 10, 12 points to keep in mind in thinking about why is it that in India a democracy has flourished. Okay, uh, and uh, let me add for the final time this caveat. When I say flourished, it's with the caveat that 
it's far from being a, a perfect uh, democracy, but of course my view is that there is no perfect democracy that I can think of, and it's not even clear that democracy is really uh, necessarily the best political system, but certainly in comparison with everything else that we've seen uh, in the last uh, six, seven decades especially, uh, including totalitarian systems, uh, autocratic dictatorships, constitutional monarchies, all so forth and so on, it seems that this is nonetheless the best political system that we can contrive, at least for the moment, right? Uh, and the puzzle remains, which I don't think has frankly uh, been, uh, uh, you know, addressed uh, as much as it should be, and I don't think anybody really knows exactly how to unravel that puzzle. The puzzle is that, that after uh, the end of World War II, when, as I mentioned to you before, uh, the biggest political movement of the day was decolonization. That is the movements in the former colonies to emancipate themselves from colonial rule, colonial power, right? And decolonization was taking place in scores of countries, right? In Asia, in Africa, and, and so on, right? Now, if that's the case, the puzzle is that in virtually all of these cases, with a few exceptions, the experiment in democracy did not survive. I mean, India's neighbors are, I think, the best testimony to that. If you look at, if you look at Pakistan, if you look at Bangladesh, it's very clear that that experiment really did not survive. Right? Uh, it was fraught with all kinds of hazards. Uh, in India, it did. So we have to ask, why is it that somehow, it, you know, democracy has been able to thrive to some degree at least? Uh, and obviously, the, the normal indices, if you look at the normal indices of democracy, such as free elections, free press, well, there's no doubt whatsoever that India really uh, has uh, uh, been able to experiment successfully with this, okay? Um, but with, as I said, the caveat that when I say successfully, there are all, all kinds of provisos you would have to think of and all kinds of limitations. Let me, however, begin with this set of comparisons. Uh, India and China is a comparison, and one of the readings that you have by Amartya Sen, that essay that you have is an uh, essay that goes into this comparison. It's a comparison that's being made all the time nowadays. Right, because these are the two sort of sleeping giants of Asia that somehow woke up. Okay, uh, in the case of China, with the reforms of 1979 and thereafter. So in, in the case of China, uh, 30 years ago, uh, you start to move towards a set of reforms which are going to get accelerated, moving China into the world economy. And you know that when the G20 met recently uh, in, uh, in England, uh, uh, the G20 is a, country, is a set of 20 countries that are the, you know, the world's economic powerhouses. Uh, well, India was never part of the G20, and now it's been included. So there are these four countries, it's, they use the acronym BRIC, B-R-I-C. I don't know how many of you know it, but if you don't, you will see references to it uh, in the press all the time. Uh, so uh, these, this refers to the, the uh, countries of uh, uh, Brazil, um, uh, uh, India, China, and there's one other country as well. Sorry? Russia. 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 That's the R over there. Okay? So this is, uh, you know, these four countries were invited to the G20 meeting as well. Okay? Um, and uh, of course, some people say that, well, India does not have that level of development. I mean, if you look at per capita income, it's, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of $1,000, $1,500, which is absolutely nothing compared to, let's say, the U.S. or Japan. Right? But nonetheless, the point here is that the comparison that is made is that these are two countries that started entering into the global economic mainstream. Okay, in the case of India, 10 years after China, the reforms really get put into place 1989 to 1991 when India decides that it's going to start exploring the other options, right? Um, one of the things that's happened in the current economic situation around the world is that India is still not fully integrated into the world economy, and therefore it has been argued by some economists that India, in fact, has withstood the present economic crisis much better than most other countries because precisely because its system is not so integrated, because it has a system of regulation. Its banks, for example, are much better regulated than the, than the, than the banks in the United States. And as you know, the, the failure of the banking system here is central to the economic crisis at hand. All right? 
Um, now, when the comparisons are made, how are the comparisons made? So you say, all right, so uh, what level of the percentage of, or, or what percentage of the population of China was able to lift, lift itself out of poverty, as opposed to India? Uh, uh, in India, there was very recently a, a study done uh, by the National Sample Survey Organization. It's NSSO. Um, and by the way, just as a little footnote, get used to acronyms if you're working on India, because if you read an Indian newspaper, uh, I mean, the number of acronyms that are used is astronomical, okay? So you have to know what these acronyms are if you're going to start working on India. So that's a National Sample Survey Organization, uh, a very reputable organization, and uh, what it does is it does sampling surveys, right? Because obviously, when you get to a country with a population of 1.1, 1.2 billion, you have to start doing sampling. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the things that they found, they gave this figure which very few people were willing to believe, but I think it's entirely plausible. They found that 80%, this is last year, 80% of the population of India lives on less than $1 a day. Less than $1 a day. Now, some people think this is highly exaggerated. And if you go to the urban areas and, I mean, the South Asians will say, well, I don't know anybody who lives on anything less than $20 a day in India. You know, I mean, so what is this $1 you know, a day? How do you come up with a figure of this kind? But obviously then that's where, for example, the distinction between urban India and rural India might come into place, that the bulk of the population of India, uh, notwithstanding the immense migration into the cities that I had alluded to in my previous lecture, that the bulk of the population is still living really in rural areas, right? Uh, but even if you thought that the figure was exaggerated, it's still exceedingly high. For China, the, the figure that is given today, uh, and here the figures are now altered a bit, that is that now they're using $2 a day or less. People who live on $2 a day or less, um, the figure that is given for India is 82 to 84 percent, okay? And for, for China, the figure that is now given is 35 percent, all right? So clearly, the alleviation of poverty in, uh, in China has gone much further. Uh, why has it gone much further? Because you would go back to, let's say, roughly around 1950, when India and China were on par. They are on par, all right? Uh, obviously, China has a slightly greater population than as it does today. But these are obviously two countries with huge populations, roughly the same level of economic development. And then if you look at them five or six decades later, you find that, well, China has certainly gone much further in some respects, in some respects, okay? And this is where these, these, these comparisons come in, right? Percentage of uh, people living under poverty. Or you look at foreign exchange reserves. Uh, the foreign exchange reserves in China are estimated at close to two trillion U.S. dollars today. Okay, uh, India in 1991 uh, had no foreign exchange reserves at all. And when they say foreign exchange reserves here, the reserves are in dollars, U.S. dollars, right? Well, today it's estimated is about 300 billion U.S. dollars of foreign exchange reserves in India, right? So to shore up the economy in the, in the event of a, uh, uh, some kind of a crisis, okay? And so forth and so on. And obviously the kinds of things you'd look at is, okay, what, what is the level of food sufficiency? self-sufficiency in food, right? And for those of you who read, and if you haven't, you really should, because I'm going to look at the essay today as well a little bit, but the essay by Arundhati Roy, which is sort of dramatically written in her usual style, um, uh, it's, it's an essay obviously on the Narmada Dam, but she gets into sort of the larger question of the political economy in India and who's benefiting from it, right, from all, the, all of these changes that have taken place. So as she herself points out, uh, food production in India went up from 51 million tons to 200 million tons. 51 million tons at the time of independence, roughly, a little bit after that, and 200 million tons a couple of years ago. So food production in India has quadrupled, quadrupled, right? Um, and not, nonetheless, uh, more than 50% of the population of India is malnutritioned, right? So then you obviously have to ask, well, if the food production has quadrupled, who has access to this food? And who does not? And why is it that some people do not have access to food? Um, in India, you have had uh, for a very long period of time, when I say long period of time, I mean right after independence, you've had what is called a public food distribution access system, okay? Uh, uh, in, in, in much more uh, colloquially, they're called ration shops, you know, when you ration food, 
okay? So which meant that if you were a, a family and you could uh, produce an identity card, you could go to a shop. They're also called fair price shops. That's the other, there are several different designations. It's exactly the same thing, right? So you would go to a fair price shop, and if you had this identity card and members of, the names of members of your family were written on that card, um, so let's say, you know, the husband and wife and, you know, three children, whatever the case might be. Well, depending on how many people there were in the family, you would be entitled to a certain amount of wheat and rice and sugar and cooking oil, okay? Four big things, right? Uh, at a highly subsidized price, right? So this was a system that was set up in post-1947. It sounds like an extraordinarily equitable system. In some respects, it was. Uh, in fact, I remember using the system when I was growing up, okay, right? In some respects, it was. And you, and you didn't have to, you know, uh, you didn't have to really, in a sense, manipulate the system. I mean, there were always allegations about some of the quality of the food being available at these fair price shops not being uh, of very good quality, for example, right? But nonetheless, you had that system in place, okay? And so if you have that system in place, then you have to ask, well, why is it that notwithstanding that system, right, that 50% of the country still suffers from malnutrition, right? And so this is the kind of comparison I'm talking about between India and China, where clearly the argument that has been given is that India has not done as well as China has. Now, let's put in two different angles into that comparison, okay? The first is, uh, that some people who concede that India has not done, uh, done as well, uh, at least in the economic domain, will also argue that nonetheless, India is doing better than China because India is a democracy, right? And so now we get into this very tricky question, right? That uh, what is the relationship between certain levels of development and the kinds of political systems that that country has, right? And I think it's no accident at all that the countries that did the best in Asia, okay, uh, for example, the countries of Southeast Asia, such as Singapore, okay, Malaysia, okay, right, and, and so on, that many of these countries, South Korea would be another good example, countries that did much, much better than both China and India, in fact, that these are countries that had what you might describe as autocratic political systems. Right? So in other words, now the argument is that in a democracy, you have certain limitations. You don't have political consensus very often. You have conflicts between people. And all of this can, in fact, be an ob obstacle in achieving economic progress. That one reason why China has achieved more economic progress has to do not only with state policies and the fact that China started to liberalize its economy much earlier, but that there is less dissent in China. Right? And so this is where Arundhati Roy is right, article comes in, because what is she showing there? She's showing that, all right, there's this huge project, right, the, the intent of the project is development, right, we're going to talk about this in substantial detail, right, the intent of the project is the development of a certain area of India, in this case, western India, okay, because it, the Narmada River and the the tributaries of the Narmada, which are going to be dammed, you know, the, the, it's basically Western India. And some of this is going to flow into neighboring states, of course, as well. Right? So the argument here is that in India, if you read Arundhati's piece here, it becomes very clear that, that economic progress has not gone as far as it could have because there is internal dissent. There are people who are disputing the project of development. And in China, you don't have relatively speaking, these kinds of disputes. I think we also have a rather monolithic view of China because I think, in fact, there is some degree of dissent in China, but I think it would be safe to say, at least I'm prepared to say it, that I think that the degree of dissent in India is unquestionably greater, okay? And that we certainly have a lot more information about what happens in India, partly because you don't really have a state which is controlling everything, as is the case in China, right? To a very substantial degree. So in, a, so in other words, all right, let me remind you of what I'm doing here. I'm saying you can use these conventional indices and say that according to the conventional indices, China is doing a lot better. A lot more telephones, a lot more cars, right? Uh, many more people in the middle class, uh, fewer people who are living under poverty, right? So forth and so on. I think you get the picture, 
Right? That's one set of arguments. Then there are people who are saying, ah, well, that may be true, but India is a democracy, and it is worthwhile to pay the price of not having developed economically to that degree, because at least you have certain kinds of political freedoms which you do not have in China. Right? And then this is a debate that will go on for a long time, because some people might well argue, and you might well argue, some of you might say, well, you know, frankly, I mean, a person needs a bread and butter a lot more than they need political freedom. Some people might be inclined to argue that. Right? And this is a long-standing debate, which I don't think we'll, we, we'll resolve, and I don't think human beings will ever resolve. I think it will continue, right? Uh, because it has to do with predil personal predilections. It has to do with how civilizations and countries think of themselves and think of their priorities, so forth and so on. However, there is also now another angle that I want to throw in before I move to the next set of comparisons. That is that it's worthwhile thinking about the fact that China and India are also the two oldest continuous civilizations in the world. And I think it's worthwhile reflecting on the fact that China and India had enormous links with each other over a very long period of time. But when they developed those links, the most obvious link, and you might not have thought about it, but when I mention it, it will, it will become clear. The most obvious link is where did China get Buddhism from? for example, right? From India, of course, right? There are large number of Indian texts, by the way, in, written in Pali and Sanskrit, the older languages, which did, do not survive, okay? Originally written in these languages, which do not survive in any Indian language. They only survive in Chinese translations, right? So these texts were taken over by monks, you know, okay, uh, to China, let's say a thousand years ago, 1200 years ago, and for various reasons, these texts, of course, this is before printing, did not survive in India, but they survived in China. So we actually have a whole number of Indian texts which only survive in, in Chinese, do not survive in an Indian language, except now in modern Indian languages that they've been translated into it, which is a different matter, okay? But the original manuscript is only available in Chinese, for example, right? So, and, and one could multiply these kinds of illustrations, right? What am I trying to suggest here? I'm trying to suggest that it seems to me and this is an argument that you can you know, reject if you want. It seems to me that there's a certain poverty in how we think when we make these kinds of comparisons. Because in these comparisons, it is a zero-sum game. One country wins, the other country loses. Okay? All you can think of is, oh, which country has more telephones? Which country has more cars? Which country has a greater you know, mileage of railways or paved roads or whatever the case might be? But is this the only basis on which one thinks about the relationship of two old civilizations to each other, right? And I think that that relationship, that sense of it, the fact that these are civilizations which are very, very complex, and you can see that in their cuisines, among other things, I think that sense of it disappears when we start to make only these kinds of comparisons, right? So I'm trying to suggest to you that let's not get seduced by this style of thinking which says that, well, the only way to really think about nation states and their place in the modern world is to make these comparisons, right? One country has this, the other country has that. But it's very clear that China and India had a set of interactions with each other where the people who were engaging in these interactions were not thinking of money at all. They were not thinking of gain, right? And you know, the nation state system is set up in such a way that one country's gain is another country's loss. That's how the system is set up, all right? So this is what I would urge you to bear in mind. That's the first comparison. Second comparison, which again might help us understand what's happening in India post-1947 and why India went a dif different way. Because remember that I'm going to also address this whole question of democracy in India. That is a comparison between India and Pakistan. Okay, I, I think that one, it may be a little easy way to put it, uh, although I think it's a charming way to put it. Uh, you could say that India is a state with an army, and Pakistan is an army with a state. Okay? I mean, the army has had overwhelming presence in the life of Pakistan in the post-1947 period. Right? I think that that is one substantial difference between India and Pakistan. So India went along with certain reforms. Uh, some of the reforms had to do with land reforms, for example. 
uh, I think that in some parts of India, land reforms were effected. Uh, in the state of Kerala, in South India, with one stroke of the pen, okay, with a, really no exaggeration, with one stroke of the pen when the land reforms were written, they, it created a massive redistribution of land ownership in that state. Okay? So, so that every family in the state of Kerala today has some property, virtually every family. Okay? I mean, they're obviously landless laborers who have come from neighboring states now who don't. But I'm saying that families that have been, communities that have been living there, you know, there was land redistribution. Because one of the problems that the Indian government had to address um, was the fact that there was massive and unequal distribution of land in most parts of India. Right, so they passed these land reforms acts. Um, in some places, they did not work. Why, did, why didn't they work? Give you an illustration of what I mean when a land reform act doesn't work. So let's suppose that you pass a land reform act, uh, and the land reform act says that a person cannot own more than, I'm just giving you a random figure, cannot own more than 20 acres of farming land. Okay, let's, let's suppose that that's what the act says. Right? So you're a big landowner. You're living in the state of UP, right, in North India which is one of the so-called undeveloped areas uh, of India, relatively, okay? So this is, and that state I was talking about, by the way, where you have this m massive land redistribution is Kerala, uh, which also, uh, so I'm going to now start intersecting with some of the other categories. Uh, you can keep some of these facts in mind. It is also a state that has 100% literacy, okay? 100% literacy, right? And there are other states, such as Rajasthan over here, okay? Uh, where the literacy uh, uh, of women in some districts is 8%, 8. And yet you have Kerala, which is 100% male and female literacy, right? So enormous differences within India. You can see that, that that point is intersecting with some of the other comparisons that I'm putting forward here, okay? But let me, this, this is UP. So as I said, here you have land reforms. Act was, that was passed. Under the illustration I was giving you, it says, let's say the act says that a landlord cannot own more than 20 acres. Let's say a landlord owns 300 acres. Okay. How does the landlord subvert the law? Any, would anybody make a guess? The landlord gets to keep all the 300 acres he has. How does he subvert it? Yeah. Something of that kind. But, but, but uh, uh, that would be a little too easy. You're moving in the right direction. That is that if he put it under his name, right, registration under his name, well, it, it, the act says you cannot own more than 20 acres. You could have six, you could have six land holdings, and they could be three acres each, and that would be fine, because that would still be 18 acres, right? Do all the states communicate with one another? Like, the, is it a massive system? No, these are state acts. This is, this is not central government legislation. Yeah, no, but it says that, let's suppose the land act said that in the state of UP, a landlord cannot hold more than 20 acres. And yet there's a landlord who has 300 acres, and the act was passed 50 years ago, and he still has 300 acres. What happened? Yeah, you, these are joint families. These are joint families. What does he do? He puts 20 acres in the name of his wife, 20 acres in the name of his elder daughter, 20 acres in the name of, you know, nephew number four, you know, niece number five, whatever the case is, right? And he retains the land. Very simple, right? So what we're saying is, okay, in India, you had land reforms, and at least in some places, they were successful. In Pakistan, you have really not had land reforms at all. So what are the differences between India and Pakistan? Why is it that Pakistan did not develop in the same way? And I want to use the word develop provisionally here. That is that it did not retain its democratic structures. That would be the phrase that I would prefer, actually. Okay, it did not retain its democratic structures. So those of you who read the, you know, the newspapers uh, or you know, read the news on the internet, whatever, you know that Pakistan has been going through a series of problems for the last you know, so many years now. Okay? Huge amount of political instability in Pakistan. Okay? Right? So what are the reasons? A, you do not have substantial land reforms, which means that the economic base okay, of Pakistani society is very, very small. There is a very small fraction of people who essentially own the land and who therefore have all the privileges that come with that kind of ownership. Okay, so it's, it's, it's much more so than India, a kind of a feudal aristocracy 
if I could put it this way. Secondly, the first principle of a democracy is the separation of civilian powers from military powers. Right? I mean, that's a, that's a rock bottom principle of a democratic society. That has not been followed in Pakistan. You have much more military intervention. The nexus between the civilian authorities and military is much greater in Pakistan than it is in India. And, and of course, you've had a number of coups in Pakistan, okay? If I could put it this way, right? Uh, you've, had you've had military rulers. I mean, the, 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 you know, before, be before uh, uh, Benazir Bhutto's uh, husband became the prime minister of Pakistan, we, you know, recently, just a little over a year ago, uh, before that happened, uh, the president of Pakistan was Musharraf, okay? Well, Musharraf is a military man, right? Okay, so you don't have civilian leaders, right? And I think that that's been a fundamental problem. You also have organizations such as the ISI. Uh, the ISI is the Inter-Services Intelligence, which is basically, a, a, if I may put it this way, the Pakistani equivalent of, you know, the FBI and the CIA rolled into one. Okay, um, these organizations have had much greater hand in Pakistan than they have had, than their, comp than their comparable, you know, organizations in India have had in India. Okay, I think that that is uh, unquestionably true. Okay, uh, but having said all of that, okay, and said that, well, this, this may be, you know, some of the reasons why Pakistan has not really developed democratic institutions or retain the democratic institutions because remember that Pakistan inherited exactly what India inherited, if I may put it this way, okay, after independence. That is that Pakistan was carved out of India. So if there was a civil service during British times, which there was, a well-oiled civil service, okay, it used to be called the ICS, Indian Civil Service, uh, then in the post-1947 period, eventually it was broken up into different services. So you have the Indian Administrative Service, the Indian Foreign Service. So, for example, you know, Indian diplomats, they belong to the Indian Foreign Service. Indian Administrative is Indian officials who govern India, right? They're, but they're, civil, uh, you know, they're part of what was the old civil service. Well, Pakistan inherited the civil service too, okay, right? And so if the civil service is something that helps to keep certain amount of stability, why didn't that happen in Pakistan? Right? That's the kind of question that we're interested in. Right? But having said that, let me now try to complicate the picture for you. And so the piece that you have written by myself called The Strange and Beguiling Relationship of India and Pakistan uh, offers a number of suggestions. Uh, one is that, look, if we assume, as many people do, that Pakistan is much more prone to be hospitable to religious extremists. Okay? So, you know, one of the concerns that the U.S. State Department uh, has had for many years is that the Pakistan is basically supporting the Taliban, okay, right? Uh, you know, how has the Taliban, uh, how has the Taliban been able to, you know, flourish uh, in Afghanistan? And remember that uh, the whole idea of the uh, war on Afghanistan after 9-11 was to wipe out, right, the Taliban, exterminate them. And if you've read the reports, you know that the Taliban rule literally 80% of Afghanistan today. So obviously that project of exterminating the Taliban didn't work, right? Okay, the whole war on terror absolutely had no real success in that part of the world at all, right? And so why didn't it? Well, some people have argued that that's because the Taliban, in fact, actually receive hospitality from Pakistan, okay? That there is an attempt to Islamicize, you know, Pakistani society even more. And we'll have, we'll have to discuss that in much greater detail later on, because how do you Islamicize a society even to a greater extent when it already is an Islamic society? Well, what does it mean, okay, to Islamicize Pakistan even more? Or to Islamicize it perhaps in a different direction? That might be a more accurate understanding of what is perhaps going on in Pakistan, right? So if we say then that Pakistan is more hospitable to religious extremists, then we come up with a real conundrum, a real puzzle, which I tried, which I mentioned in my article, right? Which is that if you look at the electorate in Pakistan, it is very clear that in Pakistan, religious parties have always received a minuscule portion of the common vote in comparison to India, where a religious party such as the BJP, which is how I would describe it as a Hindu nationalist party, okay? that the BJP, in fact, even came to govern the country. It had such strong support as part of a coalition, 
right? So if we're saying that India is much more, let me introduce the word now, much more secular, right? India is much more secular than Pakistan, then how do we explain this? How do we explain the fact that in Pakistan, religious parties actually do not get much of the vote at all. In fact, until very recently, uh, historically, if Pakistan, if a religious party got, you know, more than two or three percent of the vote, it was astounding in Pakistan. Two, three percent is virtually nothing. And in fact, in the last elections, the religious parties were decimated in Pakistan, absolutely wiped out. Right? So how do we explain this puzzle? Right? So what I'm trying to suggest is that I think we would have to do a very different kind of reading of the relationship of India to Pakistan, because I really do see them uh, 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 through the lens of the Hindi film, if I may put it this way. You know that the favorite motif of the Hindi film, right? I mean, I can't tell you how many Hindi films are of that kind. One of the favorite motifs of the Hindi film is the two brothers, right? One goes the good way, the other goes the bad way, okay? You know, one becomes the cop, the other becomes the smuggler. But you know, of course, that the guy who's a smuggler is really, really the more interesting guy. I mean, if you see this film, Divar, which, which I have assigned for the, for the film, uh, for the course, if there's anybody in this class who sees that film at the end of the viewing, uh, sympathizes more with the policeman than with the guy who gets shot at the end, I would be very, very surprised, okay? I would be very, very surprised, right? Doesn't matter. Because one thing about the Hindi film is you know the film before you've seen it, if I may put it this way, okay? That's the whole point of the film. It's not intended to, that's why India cannot generate mystery stories. Have you ever thought about it? Have you ever thought about why a Hindi film is never a mystery? You know everything right from the beginning. In fact, my wife gets highly irritated because I can even tell her the dialogue of films that I've not seen before we even start watching it, you know, if I could put it to you this way, right? You're not, that's, it, 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 there's absolutely no mystery in this kind of scenario, right? So India and Pakistan are like the two brothers who've drifted apart, okay? And we cannot view them as brothers who have drifted apart if we view them as nation states only. Because the civilization that they share is a civilization in common. It's the Indic civilization, okay? And I will talk about this relationship of India and Pakistan in greater detail elsewhere as well, but let me just conclude that comparison as I'm making it with one further observation, okay? Uh, it's an observation that will uh, require a lot more analysis at some point in time, but I want to share that observation with you. The question I said was, how do you really Islamicize Pakistan? That is, that it's an Islamic country. It began as a homeland for the Muslims, okay? Um, and we're trying to suggest that why is it that Pakistan has been hospitable to the Taliban, for example, okay? And who are the Taliban, right? And very briefly, I think that what you would have to keep in mind, and I think that this tells you, from my standpoint, what is the real problem with Pakistan in a sense today, is that we have to remember that South Asian Islam is a very different world than the Islam of the Middle East or the Islam of North Africa, okay, right? I'm going to ask a question here. Now, some of you may, may know the answer, a few of you at least might know, but uh, which part of the world has the greatest Muslim population? Indonesia. Indonesia, you said. Which part of the world? I didn't say country though. South Asia. South Asia. The largest Muslim population in the world is in South Asia. If you combine the Muslims of India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, it is greater than the Muslim population of the Middle East. Okay? Uh, Indonesia by itself has the largest Muslim population. Okay? But if you look at a region as a whole, and of course, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh were all one country before 1947. Okay? It is the largest Muslim population in the world. Now, you could live your entire life in the United States and read the American press, and when they talk about, the, when they talk about Islam, the implication is that Islam means the Middle East, right? That this is the template of Islam, that this is synonymous. The Middle East and Islam are synonymous. Yes, there's this little place called Israel there which has a Jewish population, but, you know, otherwise the Middle East and Islam are synonymous, okay? The amazing thing, of course, is that the largest population is not in the Middle East, it's in South Asia, 
where Islam had a very different relationship to the civilization that existed there already. In fact, I think that one of the greatest glories of world history is this thing called Indo-Islamic culture, which was a synthesis that developed over a very long period of time. Right? So that if you, for example, listen to Indian music today, and I'm referring here to classical music, uh, not the songs of Hindi films, although some of them actually are based on ragas drawn from Indian classical music. Uh, if you listen to this music, you can't say that it's either Hindu or Muslim. There are Muslim practitioners, there are Hindu practitioners. And that has been the case for a very long period of time. Okay? So what I want to suggest then is the following, that in Pakistan, there has been an attempt made to lure Pakistan away from its home in the Indian subcontinent, to turn Pakistani Islamic society more towards Saudi Arabia and the Middle East, which is a very different version of Islam than the kind of Islam that has existed in South Asia for a millennium. Right? This is the fundamental problem I'm trying to suggest to you. Okay? And so once we understand that, we also begin to see that, yes, the histories of these two countries drifted apart for various reasons as nation states. Right? They drifted apart, but they still have a common civilizational fount, and this is what is really under threat at the moment. That in fact what is happening in Pakistan is, is an attempt by various religious factions to say that, hey, Indian Islam is not authentic Islam. We cannot live under the shadow of that, okay? We have to turn to the Islam of the Middle East. That is an authentic example of Islam for us. And I think it's not an accident that the religious extremism that is taken place within Islam, as it has within all other religions, that this religious extremism, at least in the case of Islam, has come from the so-called Wahhabi elements in Saudi Arabia, so forth and so on. All right? So I think that this is what you'll have to bear in mind. Question over there. Oh, they're very different. Very different in terms of, for example, the kinds of separations that you have, which, in, which, which you find in the observance of Islam in the Middle East, you do not find them in India at all. For example, mutual celebration of festivals. It used to be always a matter of deep annoyance for the mullahs, for the religious leaders of Islam. Okay, especially the more orthodox ones, that in India, Muslims would celebrate Hindu festivals, especially Shia Muslims, all the time. And this is absolutely forbidden. The place of music. Okay? I mean, you know, there, some people have this view that Islam really forbids music in a way. Well, in certain strands of Islam, that happens. But you don't find that in India at all. Music is absolutely integral to the life of Muslim communities in South Asia. So forth and so on. I could, we could go down the list, you know. Okay, but these are the ways in which Islam in South Asia developed a very different identity, a very different relationship. Okay, so that's comparison number two. Number three now, urban India versus rural India. And this is where the white tiger will come into the picture to some degree, okay? Now, when I say urban India versus rural India, let's not take that as an absolute distinction, just as we've seen that we cannot take the first two distinctions as absolute distinctions, particularly India and Pakistan. We cannot take urban India and rural India as an absolute distinction, because in fact, my own view is that Indians may have left the village when they came to the city, okay? But the village never left them. Indians, even in the cities, always ruralize their landscape in certain ways. And in fact, even in the cities, it was very common. When I first grew up, in my very young days in India, I remember a cow being tethered to the courtyard of our house. Because that's what you did in the village. And you'd get fresh milk. You don't, nobody knew the word organic back then, you know? It didn't exist. But what you got was organic, certainly. Right? These were not cows that were being fed with injections and you know, antibiotics and God knows what else. Okay? But, it was in your, but this is in a city. I'm not talking about a village. I'm talking about the center of New Delhi, maybe three miles from the Capitol building, you know, the Parliament building. Right? So Indians tended to ruralize their landscape. A lot of the Hindi films that you will see 
contemporary Hindi films, they're all about, okay, the troubled relationship between the rural areas and the urban areas. Because one of the great stories of post-independent India is certainly the massive migrations. But these are people who also go back. I mean, one of the problems with so-called domestic help in India, domestic help means, you know, people working as drivers, cooks, maids, huge numbers, huge numbers. I mean, no middle class in family in India can survive without them. I can guarantee that to you. No matter how progressive they are, they might tell you that they're Marxist and this and that. They believe in, you know, uh, uh, labor unions, a right of people. Everybody should do their own work. Well, all of them, the Marxists all have six or seven, the big Marxists all have six or seven cooks, drivers, maids, you name it. Okay, right? Well, all of these people come from villages. And one of the problems that always occurs from the point of view of the middle class family always is there are always periods of time when they have to go back to the village. And when they go back, you never know if they're coming again. Okay? Because something has happened in the family there. Some dispute over the land, somebody has died, something of that kind. That relationship always exists. So it is a continuum. That's what I'm suggesting. It's not a sharp distinction. Now, there are respects in which it is a sharp distinction. So let's look at it now, not as a continuum, that is, okay, the kind of in some ways, partly seamless existence between rural India and urban India. And of course, we might also ask, by the way, how do we define? Where do the small, how do we define urban India? Where do the small towns fall? Are they really rural India? They're really not quite urban India. I mean, for those of you who've been to India and you've been to these small towns, sort of ramshackle places, you know, uh, dusty, really, really dusty, you know, the build, you know, the signs falling apart. Uh, and then suddenly, suddenly you'll see a barista. Barista is the equivalent of the Starbucks, right? Which has come into India very recently in the last 10, 15 years, right? I mean, a small town where, you know, you wouldn't expect that and suddenly you see that, yes, so it's slowly gravitating towards the city. You can look at things like outsourcing, okay? Everybody here has heard of the fact that, you know, India is the capital of the outsourcing business in the world, right? BPOs, right? Um, but outsourcing has changed because the outsourcing that went from LA to Delhi, now Delhi itself outsources some of it to the satellite towns in India. Okay? Not all of it is taking place in Delhi or Bangalore or Hyderabad anymore. They have outsourced some of the outsourcing they get to smaller because labor is even cheaper over there. Okay? Right? So you, you know, this has become a complicated process that we're talking about over here. And so that's why I'm saying that it's not clear how you would draw the line. Of course, when you see a metropolis, then you say, ah, we're in urban India. When you see Delhi or Bombay or Bangalore, Hyderabad, whatever the case may be, it's a continuum. However, as I was saying, there are also ways in which one can mark distinctions very clearly between urban India and rural India, right? And part of it has to do with the fact that urban India, for example, uh, uh, particularly the metropolises, they have a much wider contact with the world in some respects. But only certain kinds of contact. Here again, the story is a complicated one. Let me uh, give you an illustration of when I say a complicated one. This state here, the state of Kerala, okay, which I've mentioned to you as having a 100% literacy rate. Now, Kerala has a large number of villagers who have gone overseas and who continue to go overseas today, okay? In some cases, professionals as well, doctors, engineers, right? Large number of them who have gone to the Middle East. They've gone to the Middle East because in the Middle East, you've had this building boom going on for years. Now it's in a bit of a recession like everything else, but, you know, the oil-producing countries, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Oman, the Gulf, I mean, you know, if you see pictures, if you haven't been there, I mean, huge building boom, because these are oil rich countries, but they didn't really have either the labor, the skilled labor, who knew construction work, and of course, they certainly did not have a pool of qualified engineers and doctors. I mean, virtually all the engineers and doctors in countries like Kuwait and Saudi Arabia are all Indian, and Pakistani as well. In fact, in some cases, they prefer Pakistani because it's a fellow Muslim country, right, from their standpoint. Right? So now Kerala has a significant percentage of Muslims. In fact, Kerala is also astoundingly interesting because it has, you know, give or take a few percentage points. It has roughly 
the same number of Muslims, Hindus, and Christians. Three major religious groups. Okay? Right? And in Kerala, you have had people who have been going off, as I said, to work in Saudi Arabia, in Kuwait. And then what do they do? These people send back money, remittances, right? As they call. Right? And you can see, by the way, the influence of this. You're going in this lush Kerala countryside, and suddenly there'll be this huge mosque, right? Built very recently with money that has come. Okay? From there. Right? So even there, I'm saying, when I said, remember the, the point that I was making was that urban India, rural India, well, one distinction you can make is that urban India has a greater contact with the rest of the world. And then I said, well, even that can be modified, but it has a certain kind of intellectual contacts between people. Uh, but that's a very small percentage. What I'm talking about is a middle class that travels, okay? Right? That has relatives in the diaspora, you know, that thinks of itself as cosmopolitan. Well, that's much more likely to happen in the urban area than it is in the rural area. But rural Indians also have contacts with the wider world, partly through these kinds of labor migrations that I've suggested to you, okay? But what might be another big distinction? So for example, how does caste operate? The institution of caste, right? Which some of you will know nothing about at this point in time, but we'll get to it at some point. Uh, the, ins the caste is a system of stratification in Indian society that every everybody or at least every Hindu follows certain caste rules or is supposed to, uh, or rather the best way of putting it, the simplest way of putting it is that, that Hindu society is divided into various castes, okay? And there are, there are rules and regulations that govern the behavior of castes towards each other, okay? Now, I think it is unquestionably true that these rules have greatly eroded in the urban context. Okay, so if there is a set of tacit rules that upper castes will not mix with, you know, lower castes, right? I think the likelihood that it's going to be violated, that rule is much greater in the urban area than it is in the rural area. Okay, so you know, you could make distinctions of this kind, uh, but the point here is that there has certainly been uneven development, okay, now, in urban India as opposed to rural India. So when we asked the question in the previous class, what percentage of the population of India has access to electricity, safe drinking water, right? Schools, all of that. When we ask that question, we should then not only simply give a whole number and say, oh, 50% of the population has access to it, we'll have to then further divide it. What percentage of the population in urban India has access to it as opposed to rural India, right? So one of the big differences is that schools in rural India are in absolute shambles, absolute shambles. I mean, this is one of the biggest failures of the state in India is the schooling system, okay? And the urban India, you know, partly because people have obviously a greater degree of education, there are lobbies, there are constituencies, right? You can, you can agitate for your rights, for the rights of your children to education, right? In urban, in rural India, it's much more difficult to do so. Healthcare delivery in rural India is a massive problem. You have very few do doctors who are willing to go, unless that person is a good Samaritan type, or somebody with a conscience and says, well, I'm not in the profession simply to make money, right? Right, so this is the kind of disparities we're talking about between urban India and rural India. Very massive in some respects, and yet, as I'm suggesting, there is a continuum between the two. So don't think of this as a very sharp distinction in every respect. North India, South India. I spoke about this to some degree before, right? When, for example, I pointed to the fact that if you look at South India, you have a different linguistic system in place. That is that you have these four Dravidian languages. In North India, you have, you know, languages that are largely uh, uh, Indo-European, okay? Right? Um, it is very clear that colonial penetration of India was not as extreme in some parts of South India. Okay, is Islam traveled to South India? Of course it did, because remember Kerala, which is way down in the south, as, as I've already pointed out, a very significant Muslim population. But nonetheless, you could say that South India retained its Hindu culture to a greater degree than North India, right? There's less conflict between Muslims and Hindus that took place in South India than what took place in North India. 
right? These are the kinds of things that one could speak about what one makes a distinction between North India and South India. But I think there are other distinctions. And here again, I think the economic indices are quite interesting because I think on the whole, you could say that literacy levels in South India in all the four states, not just Kerala, but all the four states as an aggregate are much higher than they are in North India, okay? So if you look at economic development, if you look at the, the nature of development of these places, we see some sharp differences between South India and North India. Uh, they're also, by the way, highly pejorative sort of, you know, if I may put it this way, stereotypes, okay, and meanings that North Indians have about South Indians. And I think that South Indians have about North Indians as well, to some degree. But I think that certainly North Indians have, uh, so for example, this state, Tamil Nadu, you know, its capital is a city called Chennai. It used to be called Madras for 300 years. Uh, a lot of these uh, places have changed names. Uh, we'll talk about that at some point, okay? They changed names, and so Madras. So, you know, if you were from Madras and you were living in Delhi, everybody in South India, didn't matter whether you were from Tamil Nadu or Kerala, everybody in South India was a Madrasi, as they were called, okay? And that meant that you were eating dosas your whole life, you know, okay? So there were these kinds of conceptions that people had in North India about people in South India. South Indians are also supposed to be more brainy, uh, whereas North Indians are supposed to be more brawny, okay? You know, uh, so if I may uh, make a crude distinction here, North India has agriculture and South India has culture, you know, right? I mean, that's the kind of thing that you would hear in sort of common language, okay? And of course, some of these are stereotypes, some of them are preconceptions and prejudices, but if they are part and parcel of the way people think, then we have to take them for what they are, right? Okay, and, and the fact that these conceptions exist suggests that there was always some sense of difference between North India and South India. All right, older cities versus newer cities. Something that really is very seldom talked about. Okay, and as I said, you know, this doesn't mean that if I make this distinction that I think that this is the most important distinction along with the others. I'm just giving you illustrations here now, okay, when we get into older cities versus newer cities. So what are the newer cities? When I say new here, even that's, I mean, by the scale of American history, certainly, you know, they're all old, okay? Uh, so when I say newer cities, what I'm referring to here is colonial cities, which are largely port cities, right? So over here, Bombay, right? over here, Madras, right, over here, Calcutta, okay, right? These are, these are relatively new cities in the scheme of Indian history. When I say relatively new here, I'm saying 400 years, okay? 400 years, because these are port cities developed under the colonial regime. Now you go to a place like Delhi, okay? And Delhi, there's something called New Delhi, which was built by the British, Okay, but, simply, but they simply added a capital to previous capitals that had already existed because Delhi has a history that goes back 2,500 years, right? No question about it, right? I mean, everyone who came through North India eventually had to show his mastery by establishing himself in Delhi, okay? So, I mean, if you were a foreign power and you were going to establish your mastery over the United States, you would not do it by trying to take over Fargo, North Dakota. You would do it by taking control over New York, right? So, yes, similarly, Delhi had this enormous place in Indian history. It's a much older city. And yet, it's a very new city. Why? Because, partly because of its political associations, that when a political dynasty crumbled, Right? Delhi crumbled. Delhi crumbled. Right? So, and you'll see where I'm getting to with this point, right? Just bear with me for a minute. You'll see where I'm getting to. Delhi before 1947 had a population of less than half a million. Today, it has 15 million people. Enormous growth. Now, all of the cities have, have witnessed enormous growth, but Comparatively, Delhi has witnessed a lot more growth, okay, than has a city such as Bombay or Mumbai, as it's now called. So Mumbai, pre-1947, would still have had a population of something in the neighborhood of 2 million, okay? And it was a city that was deeply beloved by the people, well-known buildings, 
a social, cultural, life, all of that. Okay? Now Delhi had a little bit of that in what is called Old Delhi. Okay? What is called Old Delhi, which is a part of Delhi that goes back to the Mughals in the 16th century. But Old Delhi is really a very small part. If you look at Delhi today, it's really a minuscule portion, a fraction of Delhi. So what we're saying is the following, that if you look at, let's compare Bombay and Delhi for a moment, or let's compare Calcutta, East India, now called Kolkata, okay? Um, again, a population of roughly 15, 16 million, huge, okay? So Bombay and Calcutta are more similar. Both of these are colonial port cities. Both of them had significant populations, okay? And by the 19th century had a significant <coughs> social, intellectual, cultural life. Communities that had lived in that city for two, three, four, five, six generations already. Delhi, on the other hand, is largely a city of immigrants, refugees, government employees. It's a capital of India. So, you know, when, when you have a capital, it means that you're going to have people who are going to come and work for the government, right? But these are people who work for the government who don't really have a loyalty to the city as such. They don't have any emotional attachment to the city. And in 1947, when the migrations took place, remember the migrations of the partition that I had talked about? Well, a significant number of people, Hindus who fled, came into Delhi. Okay? So Delhi's growth was very rapid, very astronomical, okay? and filled with chaos, if I may put it this way. Now, the significance of this is the following, that when you have a city like Delhi, when riots take place, okay, killings take place on various grounds, it could be religious differences, for example, okay, you did not have communities that exercised restraint, right? Because in a sense, Delhi was up for grabs. If I may put it this way, whoever can muscle his way through the city, establish his or her control, takes Delhi. That mentality existed in Delhi, exists down to the present day. It's one of the most unsafe cities for women anywhere in the world, if you ask me. Okay? And I think all women in, who have lived in, in Delhi would know that. I mean, it's very commonly said that by them, and I think there's a reason for it. Because it has this kind of, if I may use this just colloquially, because I think you'll understand the sentiment I'm talking about. It has this kind of wild west, you know, okay, touch to it that you see in the old westerns in America, you know, in the old John Ford films, for example, okay? Right? A place where a kind of a lawlessness prevails in a certain way, okay? That was not the case and is really not the case with Bombay and Kolkata. So when a killing take place in Bombay, everybody's shell-shocked. It's like, how could it happen in Bombay? Because in Bombay, you have communities that care for their people, their constraints. People understand the limits to violence, right? These limits have never really been properly understood in a city such as Delhi. This is what I mean by the distinction between the older cities and the newer cities. So here I'm not valorizing, by the way. As you can see, I'm not suggesting that the older cities are better, necessarily, right? They may be. Yeah, there may be, because there's portions of Delhi which is really old Delhi, which, okay, and we've seen that that place has also had quite a lot of conflict. But I think in general it's true that when I say here by the older cities, I'm talking about cities which are pre-colonial, okay, uh, they had a certain kind of culture. So these are cities that were, for example, pilgrimage cities, right? It, the city became important because it was a site of pilgrims, because there's an important temple there. A good example would be the city of Puri, okay? Right? Which is in Orissa in eastern India, right? Banaras, Banaras, famous, right? In, in central, north central India, a much, much older city. You know, the history of going back to about 2,000 years, all right? I'm suggesting that these cities have a different cultural ethos, different sense of community, different notions of lifestyle, than some of the other cities, okay? And so here the idea is not to really just simply say, oh, older cities are better or newer cities are better. It's to suggest that even when we look at urban areas in India, we cannot assume that these urban areas are in some sense monolithic. In fact, they're vastly different and that they're vastly different because they're informed by very different kinds of histories. Yeah.
no, they, well, no, they're really, they're really newer cities because these are cities that are basically colonial cities, right? The older cities would be pre-colonial, such as Delhi. And yet I'm saying that Delhi is a complicated example because, yes, its history goes back 2,000, 2,500 years, right? But on the other hand, Delhi is a newer city as well because essentially it never had the kind of settled communities that the cities such as, okay, Bombay or Calcutta have, right? So I'm complicating it because those are the newer cities, but they have older communities in some ways. But then, of course, there are older cities with older communities, and the best example of that would be the city of Banaras, right? Which is an older city. It's pre-colonial, established long before the colonial regime came okay, into place, and it has these older established communities. So we could, we could talk about older cities that are new, newer cities that are old in certain respects, so forth and so on. You see, what I'm trying to suggest to you is, do not think of urban in India as one kind of single monolithic complex, right? There's an enormous difference between the cities in India, because the cities are less homogenized than they are, it seems to me, in places such as the United States, okay? I mean, one of the things that brings in homogenization into American cities, all of them, whether it's Chicago, New York, LA, whatever, right, is, for example, English, right? The fact that eventually English is the official language, the, own, the language you need in order to have mobility. The other thing that brings in homogenization is McDonald's, Burger King, Walmart. I mean, Los Angeles Unified School District, where my children go to school, very proudly says, oh, we have kids coming from 170, 170 different language backgrounds. Yeah, but they all go to Burger King, I can tell you that. Doesn't matter whether they come from 170 language backgrounds and speak Laotian or French or, you know, Cambodian or Hindi, right? They all eventually end up at McDonald's and Burger King and Walmart, okay? <laughs> right, so the degree of homogenization is very, very different than what you are going to find in India. And of course, one of the tendencies of, that you find in India, because that's the tendency of modernity, is that you're seeing the same kind of homogenization slowly creeping in, but yet there's a lot of resistance to it, right? And that's where things like that continuum between urban India and rural India becomes highly, highly important, okay? Right? Then the distinction between Hindu India and Muslim India, and here again, even more so than all the other distinctions, a very provisional distinction, because I have just argued for you in the early part of this lecture today, that I think there is a kind of a Hindu-Muslim synthesis that developed, a kind of an Indo-Islamic culture that developed in India, okay? And so I gave you an example of cuisine, gave you an example of architecture, or I didn't, but I'm giving it to you now, gave you the, the example of music, okay? Three areas where you have enormous synthesis of Hindu and Islamic elements, right? But having said that, I think it's also important to keep in mind that there, there is Provisionally, we can think of something called Muslim India and Hindu India, provisionally, for certain purposes only, okay? And with enormous amounts of provisos and caution. Because the minute you put these as categories, they acquire a life of their own, you see? And so we want to be sure that we don't put more life into these categories than they already have. Why do I make that distinction, however? Because I think it's very clear that on the whole, Muslims in India belong to the lower strata of Indian society. They are affluent Muslims, they are Muslim bus businessmen, but if you look at levels of education, and some of this goes back to British times, okay? Some of this goes back to British times, to the 19th century, we know that when modern Western type education came into India, modern Western style universities came into place, the University of Delhi, University of Allahabad, the University of Bombay, right? that Hindus gravitated to these in much greater numbers than did Muslims. So there's a book by Peter Hardy. You know, I'm, I'm going to cite works throughout the course, and if, for those of you interested, a book by Peter Hardy called The Muslims of British India, which is a detailed study of these kinds of discrepancies and differences that develop between the Hindu community and the Muslim community. And when I say community here, again, I'm saying it very provisionally because it's not like there is one Hindu community and one Muslim community. There are multiple communities within each of these faiths, okay? But here I'm just for the sake of argument, okay, right? So when one says Muslim India, I think, yes, one is speaking of a group of people, 
very substantial, who I think labor under much more difficult conditions, levels of poverty are higher, levels of affluence are much lower, levels of education are much lower, okay? And there is a committee that was appointed by the Indian government. Um, they issued a massive report. I think it's actually one of the best documents that has come out of India because I think it's a fair document. I think it's based on exhaustive research. Okay, it's called the Sanchar Committee Report. Uh, these pen, none, none of these markers are working. Uh, Sanchar is S-A-N-C-H-A-R, okay? And you can find it on, on the internet, or at least parts of the report, the Sanchar Committee Report. Just filed its report about two years ago, this commission. And what did this commission do? It investigated the status of Muslims in India. And it came to the conclusion that in virtually every state across a whole slew of professions, the Muslims in India were doubtless based in the lower strata. Okay, so that they're fundamental problems of equality that we have to think about. Okay, the population, Muslim population is comparatively more urban based than the Hindu population. Okay, they tend to be segregated into certain professions. And of course, at the same time, we have to remember that the constitution of India is very clear that you do not discriminate on the basis of religion. So then the question is, if, if discrimination is illegal, and yet we know that this community is laboring under some kinds of systematic disadvantages, then the question is, why is that the case? What is its history? And similar kind of thing could be argued for African Americans in the US. I mean, technically you can't discriminate against a person on the basis of their race or color. But we know that if you look at levels of achievement, advancement, education, access to jobs, we know that there's enormous differences between the African American community and the white community. And we also know that, yes, these are not monolithic because they're obviously poor whites as well, for example, right? So I think that you understand all of these provisos and caveats. And when I say Hindu India and Muslim India here now, here in particular, I am referring to number one, economic criteria, and number two, even more important in some ways, integration into the social life of India. I think that has not really happened for the most part. Okay? So yes, uh, Indo-Islamic cultural synthesis developed in India, but at the same time, if you're looking at intermarriages, between Hindus and Muslims, they're very, very rare, very rare, right? And they may or may not be desirable. I don't think you should assume automatically that intermarriage is necessarily a sign of progress. You shouldn't assume that. It may be, it may not be. We would have to analyze the arguments for that. Okay, but I'm saying that if you look at the integration, so if you look at intellectual communities, okay, how well are Muslims integrated into intellectual communities, into university life? That's what I mean by social life, okay? How well are they integrated into the civil services, right? And then somebody will come along and say, ah, but India had a Muslim president, right? Okay, but that would be a bit like saying, ah, now that we have an African-American president of the United States, therefore it means all African-Americans have achieved equality. I mean, that would be a daft argument, frankly. I mean, because anybody who made it wouldn't really know what's going on, right? And so I don't think that we could use examples of that kind and point to, you know, some very successful Muslim businessman, for example, Azim Premji, okay, a sort of a legend in India, you know, the, found, the, the CEO, founder of Wipro, W-I-P-R-O, one of the largest outsourcing, you know, businesses in the world, uh, one of the wealthiest business uh, people in the world, you know, has been in the fortune, you know, 50, top 50 for, for dog's years now, okay, right? So you couldn't look at that and say, ah, well, that shows, tells us something. It certainly says that, yes, there are some disparities within the Muslim community as well. But I'm really speaking about, let me just reiterate and I'll conclude, that when I say Muslim India here, okay, I'm speaking about the fact that in certain areas of life, in certain domains of life, it is very clear that there is a distinction between Muslims and Hindus. It is very clear in the economic domain. And it is very clear with respect to the question of integration of Muslims into civil society, okay, into the social fabric of life in India. At some level, that integration is very, very deep. 
right? When you look at religious festivals, when you look at certain kinds of social contexts, and yet there are other areas where it seems that the differences are profound. Yes. I would agree that that is the case. Yeah, I would agree that that is the case, but your question, which is a very good question, is exceedingly complicated because what it would require us to do is to look at the nature of Hindu-Muslim relations in India over a very substantial period of time. Right? So one of the things that happened under colonial rule was a sense of trying to separate the Hindus from the Muslims, partly because it facilitated British rule. You divide them. right? But to some degree, you, it's easier to divide them when there's already some basis of feeling of distinction between the two. You know? And I, I always put this in, a, I'll, I'll, end the, I'll end my lecture today with this dramatic sort of note. I mean, I often say that you know, the, the colonial ruler thought of uh, Hindus and Muslims in the following way, okay? in the most cryptic possible way that you can think of. The Hindu venerates the cow, worships the cow. The Muslim loves to eat it. Okay, That's how they thought of it. And they said, you cannot possibly have two communities that are more different than these. Right? I don't agree with that assessment, but this is how they would have put it. All right, so we'll carry on from here next week.